Hello, everybody. Welcome to the fifth episode of CelebWorks Live, where Cobra Commander should have stuck with his day job as a used car salesman. I'm Chris Arsaga. I'm Neri Lemus. Thanks for joining us. Before we bring on our special guest, we want to remind you that you can be automatically entered to win an autograph 8x10 autograph from Mary Gibbs, the voice of Boo from Monsters, Inc. All you have to do is share this live stream and we will contact the winner after the show ends. I'm excited to bring on the largest convention power couple to the program, but before I bring them on, let's introduce them. GalaxyCon Events, formerly known as SuperCon or Super Festival, is one of the largest independent convention companies in the United States. Their roster includes powerhouse events in Raleigh, Richmond, and Minneapolis. It is generally agreed within the industry that Raleigh falls among the top 20 in the United States. SuperCon, which was founded in 2006, uh, was founded in order to bring a large-scale convention to South Florida. Their average attendance of 1,500 people in 2006 grew to events established across the country, bringing as high as 50,000 people in 2020. On a personal note, Chris and I want to say that CelebWorks has been working with them since the very beginning of our company. Michael Broder and Sandy Martin were the first industry titans to work with us. They have had our roster make well over 50 client appearances at their various shows throughout the years. They were the largest convention company to give us a chance when, and because of them, CelebWorks works with 10 of the other large convention companies as of 2020. Mike Broder and Sandy Martin's convention model has been copied by aspiring promoters across the country. This team is the reason that voiceover has headlining spots at Comic-Con events, inviting voiceover talent when very few promoters did. In addition to us, there is many agents and voiceover talent that are extremely grateful to this team for the roles they've played in our convention careers. We are proud to personally know them and proud to call them both friends inside and outside the business. Please welcome Michael Broder and Sandy Martin of Galaxy Con Events. Hello. Yay. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. <laughs> distance. Uh, I yes. guess <laughs> you're all set up. It's perfect. I love it. We're, we're too close, so we we're have to wear close, masks. So we have to. We're afraid. That's great. That's phenomenal. Uh, what uh, was the design for... on? What was the design on the masks, guys? I think there's designs, right? Yeah, we got to see that. So this is paw prints because we have little kitties. Oh, I love turtles. it. It's perfect. That's a perfect one. Yeah, I turtles. love it. My Marvel ones in the other room. I couldn't grab it in time. Well, you know, I, <laughs> I, I'm so glad you guys could join us considering the circumstance. I mean, I know that there's a lot of stuff going on. So, and you yes, guys are very busy, Neri. Very busy. Very busy. Very <laughs> busy. Very Absolutely. Busy. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I'm hoping that you guys are okay with answering some questions. Is that, is that okay? Well, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on what you want to know. <laughs> and also to the general public, if you have any uh, questions for the GalaxyCon team or us, please post them on the official stream and we will answer them if we can. Okay, okay guys. You know, a lot of people don't know. Yeah, let's jump in. Jump in. <laughs> a lot of people don't know the behind the scenes stuff. And you guys are sort of these uh, figures that are, you know, we know who you are. We know your faces. You guys are, you know, public figures, but we don't necessarily know your backgrounds per se. Is there any way you guys can sort of tell us how you guys got into the industry and sort of give people an idea of, uh, you know, your backgrounds? Let me start. Well, you started this thing. So, All right. so I, I, I've been going to conventions since I'm nine years old. So the first ever fan convention I went to was in the very early 80s. It was a creation show in New York, probably in the Roosevelt Hotel. I don't remember, but it was in one of those hotels. Um, you know, I've owned comic book stores. I've been in the independent film business, you know, uh, distribution. I have done a number of things prior to conventions. And then in 2006, I ran movie theaters. I ran, you know, I was a, a, a roadie, you know. I, um, but in 2006, when, at, when I had been an independent film for a while and there had been a shift with the end of really uh, blockbuster video, Hollywood video and DVD sales, and things were starting to shift to digital, but it hadn't quite gotten there with technology and independent theaters were closing. I need, you know, started looking for what else could I do? And a buddy of mine, PD, had a horror show in Florida called Scream Fest. It's now Spooky Empire. And I had helped him kind of get that off the ground and, you know, worked with him a little bit on the marketing. And 
saw it, it was moderately successful and he was moving it. We were in Fort Lauderdale. He was moving it to Orlando and uh, there were no other conventions in South Florida. And the one convention we had was a horror convention that was moving. And so I said, hey, I'm going to go do this Comic-Con thing. And he's like, all right, go do the Comic-Con thing. And so I did, uh, I started Supercon in 2006. And like you said, 1,500 people in a Hollywood Beach resort where my headliners were Margot Kidder, the Iron Sheik, and Billy West. Wow, um, that's great. And that was where I, <laughs> I love it. learned the power of voice acting with in conventions because Billy West had the longest lines. I had, Jack, I had a, a, a bunch of other guests there, you know, a couple other Superman you know, guests and, and some other people, but Billy West was really the headliner of that show. And uh, Mike thought he was going to put on a Superman convention. <laughs> he was lining up guests related to the Superman right, I had the, the guy who was non from Superman. So Jack O'Halloran, right? Jack O'Halloran so, had George yeah, yeah. 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 from Superboy. I had Margot Kidder. I had Noel Neal, the original Lois Lane. Oh my gosh. Oh, wow. I, had a whole, I had a whole Superman theme going because that was when the Brian Singer Return of Superman movie was coming out, Superman Returns. And I'm a huge uh, Superman fan. I love the Christopher Reeves movies. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do a Superman themed Comic Con. I started marketing it. Which is how it got the name Supercon. Right. That's amazing. Oh, oh, that's so no, cool. I didn't I know no that, that. I mean, I was just <laughs> thought so because cool. your events were huge. Then, no. you know, that's no. no. The original one was called Supercon because it was going to be a Superman, superhero theme. And the, and the original thinking, because at the beginning I didn't know what the hell I was doing, was, oh, we'll do Superman, the first one. And then if we do it again, we'll do Batman. So what was that going to be? Uh, Batcon? No, I'm like Batcon. Batcon. I didn't know it was going to be right. Supercon because it's a superhero convention, right? Oh, of course. Yes. Uh, exactly. So, but the first one was going to be Superman. And then the second one would be Batman. And then we could do other themes. But nobody gave a damn. Oh, you of, could have had Batcon, Antcon, <laughs> Hawk. Absolutely. Con. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, Flashcon. No Look that. at all these ideas oh, that God. we're giving people. I it's, screwed it's, up. It's, you could just print money with these ideas. Well, the, the problem was <laughs> that nobody gave a damn about a Superman convention. And we couldn't sell any tickets. And then I started to get more generic. I'm adding more comic guys. Uh, well, I have to say, Mike, you had 1,500 people your first time around. There's some people that don't even have three people in the Wait. building. Trust me, I, I, we've been there. We've been at events like that. Yes, I, so I know. You, 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 we did one of those too. Yeah, we, we <laughs> happened once. No, um, but see, that's what people want to know. Because Mike, it's it's a success story. You guys are the American dream. You guys took something, you built it, and you've made it a success. And now you've replicated that model to three other, four other cities. And you know, you guys right. are constantly expanding. So. You guys are the American dream. So please tell us about it. So there was, you know. Well, no. So yeah, I, so. <laughs> so the first show, I, I, like I said, my indie film company had kind of bombed out and I needed to figure out how to make money. And so I didn't have, I didn't have any money left. And I did the show. I had nothing. I had no money. I was doing odd jobs. I was delivering pizzas wow. to make the money to pay for the flyers to take to other huh. shows to promote the first Supercon. So I would go work during the week at a pizza place and then make enough, you know, I'd make enough money to pay my bills and then I'd get flyer money and then I'd go to like Megacon in Orlando or, you know, some other small show somewhere and promote the hell out of my show. And then I, you know, try and collect vendor money and I book guests. And so that first show was done on, on with nothing. I mean, literally nothing. Wow. And I got the building. It was a dilapidated old uh, hotel in a, in a, in a kind of a mall, it was a hotel mall hotel that had been uh, big in the nineties that was basically all shut down, but they still had people that, you know, use the hotel and there were still some shops there. And there was, it was, it was very odd, but it was cheap and it was a lot of space. And so it was a lot of space, very cheap. And I pulled it off and it worked. And then I'm like, all right, well, let's do this again. And the idea was I was just going to do it long enough until I got back into film. I was just trying to figure out my next angle in the film business. I was trying to figure out how I was going to get financing for the next movie or get back into that business. How long again before you realized you weren't We're, going back into film? It was what years. was the year? It's 2013. <laughs> so it's, a, it's amazing you, you say that, Mike, because literally the same thing for me. I mean, I, I had to figure out a way to support my family. And leaving college, you know, there was a time in my life where it, it was do or die. So 
I literally started representing people with Chris just in order to get back into the film industry later on. Now it's five years later. Well, right. well <laughs> done, but right. uh, it, no, it, it's, I definitely get what you're saying. I, that's incredible. So um, yeah, it was, it was um, yeah. For the first from 2006 to 2013, if anybody asked me what I did, I said, well, I'm, a, I'm an indie film distributor. I mean, right now I'm doing these cons, but like my real thing is I'm just, waiting for the right film. And then I think around 2013, I looked around and saw the people and I said, well, I don't think I'm distributing movies anymore. Like it just <laughs> dawned on me one day that just this was what That's I did. A, I'm sure that was a cool realization too. You were just like, whoa, this is like huge. Well, you I know? realized I had been doing this almost as long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and that, it can be empowering though, that moment of realizing, you know what? You know, I'm not, I'm not going, I don't think I'm going back. And the, you want to know the moment? And it was actually with Sandy is that I never told people that I was an agent when walking to a, in a, <laughs> into a Comic-Con. Never, I never said the words. And so then the, I gave you so much shit. Yes. So I walked, so we're walking in and I think it, I don't know if it was Raleigh or Florida. I mean, I think it was Florida. So I, I'm walking into no, the, was, Raleigh. was it Raleigh? Okay. I'm oh, walking yeah. in the building and she goes, wait, wait. Who are you? And I'm there like, was what? This, I got called because by security. Because oh, did you? I didn't even <laughs> know that. Of yes, course. Because, <laughs> because some a VIP was trying to get in early, and ah. I and I was trying to open the show, and I, they're like, he won't go away, and I said, well, VIPs <laughs> don't get in early. He's saying he has to be in there, and I was like, oh, fine, I'll I'll walk <laughs> over and find out what's going on. And so I didn't know you at all. You've been working with Mike for I don't know how long, but we had never met. And you said you were a VIP. And then I saw your badge. And I said, then why do you have a guest badge? And I was pissed. <laughs> I, I hated how saying- How did you get that? And I, then you said, I'm an agent. And I was like, oh, well, why didn't you just say so? Of course, you, they yeah. don't win. <laughs> I, I, see, for years, I didn't want to say that. It sounded too pretentious to me. You walking into another city and going, I'm an agent. I mean, I, that's just, for me, that my mind doesn't compute to this day. Like Mike said, I was still a <laughs> filmmaker, a world wanderer. There was no agent in my mind. So, you know, it, that was a I funny was like, realization. You're not a, you're not a VIP. Do you know that <laughs> moment? <laughs> You're from a slimy the, agent. I'm just kidding. That, that from that moment on, I said to everybody, I'm an agent because Sandy told me to. So that's that's that was my big moment. You <laughs> so, yeah, but you still you still have a problem with saying it though. I, I kind of do, yeah. I'm I, yeah. I don't know. It's get, just, o it's, get over it. it I, okay. You I just will. gotta know the right time to do it. That's all. Like in that particular situation. Yeah, you, I'm you an mean, agent. Let me get inside. You mean when like some guys <laughs> fighting us for chicken wings downstairs in the Raleigh Hotel? Is that the time to use it? Is that no, the time? That's no, that's exactly no. the time. Absolutely. <laughs> when Gilbert Boyaz is there to, and Rick Henricks are there to. Well, it's a funny story. So for people that don't know, we were actually in a hotel at one of Mike's shows, and it's all of us, and we were doing the you know the business <sighs> stuff to the show, and it's me, Gilbert Boyas, Chris, Sandy, and Mike. And some guy who is drunk out of his mind walks over and tries to take some of our food that was laid out there. And I said, hey, man, you know, you, you can't be eating our food. He goes, why? Like, no, no, <laughs> no wonder in the world. And we're like, because it's not yeah, yours. Yeah. And he goes, but so why? The guy, so the guy started a fight with us. And, so he started a fight. Uh, yeah. But guess, guess who kicked his ass? It wasn't Gilbert <laughs> Boyce and it wasn't me. It wasn't Chris. It was Sandy Martin who kicked his ass and got him out of That's there. That's right. It was pretty amazing. So here's the thing I've learned since being with Mike. And and I and I haven't ever had a relationship quite this predictably strong. He will fuck you up if you <laughs> if, if you lay a finger on me. I love it. Of course. And, and I've never seen him fuck anyone up, but I am quite certain. He could pummel someone to pulp. She's and, heard stories though. And so I have no fear. And so I just walked <laughs> right up, got in the guy's face, and I said, you need to walk away. At least I, I think that's what I said. You did. No, you said exactly that. And he was I, more- I think in that situation, 
that situation, you had plenty of backup because you had me, you had Gilbert yeah, there. But, we all would have. He was scared yeah, of her, not us. He wasn't no, scared no. of me. He wasn't scared of Gilbert. He wasn't scared of you. He was scared of Sandy, and he walked away. So that's, yeah, that's that true. was that was a, a stellar <laughs> moment. And then I didn't mean to get off track, but those are a little funny. Well, there's anecdotes. nothing like like crazy eyes of a redhead. Like uh, oh, that's wow. true. I well, will. Yeah, you don't mess with redheads. Mm -mm. <laughs> no, the, it's, <laughs> we can be terrifying. I look. I've never seen that side of you, Sandy, and I feel blessed. So, thank oh my you. god! Well, you haven't seen the documentary. <laughs> I have not seen Surviving oh Supercon. Oh I gotta god. watch that. What? Mike's like, wait, wait till you see it. <laughs> in 2013, we had a security guard who was seven feet tall. Uh, maybe about 450 pounds. Who? Holy cow! Let me rephrase. He wasn't a security it. guard. He was. He was. He was a friend who was. He was an a, a acquaintance who was helping. He's a security guard. No, he was in in the real world. He was a law enforcement professional, kind of. And wow, he was helping us guy. out. And he was helping us out, and he was there to help manage security, and so. And. And we were 10 minutes late opening the show on Saturday. And this was the year that we probably, we had more people in the building than we should have had. And, and, and they were piled up in the lobby, like wrapped around the building. They were trying to get in and we were 10 minutes late opening. And I come up and I'm like, why, why aren't we open? And he goes, we need a megaphone. And I was like, why do you need a megaphone to open a door? And he goes, we have, we need it for crowd control. And I said, the all you have to do is open the door. <laughs> And he said, if you think you can do this better than you do it, I was like, fine. And so I gathered a couple people just to like tell people where to go when they come in. And, and as I go to open the door and, and he stops me, he's like, it takes a real person to do this job. And <laughs> I jumped up on my tippy toes. Cause he's seven feet tall and you've met Wingy, right? Yes. And so Wendy did the nicest thing anyone has ever done for me in my whole life in that moment. He put his hand on my chest to make it look like he had to hold me back because I would rip this guy apart. <laughs> That's hilarious. I love and, it. And um, that is so good. I'll I never know. forget that moment. And then I was told it's either me or her. Yeah. I'm still. Oh, <laughs> well, we see who won that battle. There, but, there have uh, been a few people along the way who've demanded it's them or me. I mean, you know, be, Sandy, you, you, you're always composed. I've never seen you, oh. in, you know, <laughs> you're always composed. <laughs> I, you know, I've never seen, I've ne not towards me. You've never got upset well, Mary, at me. That's because when you see the documentary, you are in the back. Oh, I am in the back <laughs> a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With me. Oh, okay, got it. She's in the front. Got it. Oh, going off. Many years. <laughs> She's in the front. And so I'm dealing with you numbskulls in the back and the line <laughs> and the talent and the photo ops and all that nonsense. And I'm on the floor with the vendors. She handles the security outside, line control outside, venue stuff, you know, flow of traffic, like real security stuff. Attendees Attendee, who get into fights or grab ass. Missing or kids. So is yeah. this is this is that your common day in the life of your show every day? Is that what you do, Sandy? And that's what you do, Mike? Is you focus on the back room, Mike, and then Sandy the focuses show. on the front? Yeah, now, I'm front of house, he's back of house. So you guys are the definition of a true power couple. I mean, I've never met anybody in this business that has that power couple structure that you guys have. How do you guys make it work so well? I mean, it could be tough because sometimes your work come comes home with you, I assume, right? I mean, we're in our bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think that is? I mean, we have GalaxyCon. Right? I love it. Yeah. Really We've enough. got our GalaxyCon wallpaper. No, it's never a pee from the show. I brought it home from the office. I mean, the secret is to bring the work into the bedroom, obviously. Wouldn't that be? <laughs> uh, well, he's, making me, he's making me move things around this week. Yeah. Well, that's good. So you guys constantly work on that stuff. I think that's great. And I mean, you guys are the only people I know that have made uh, uh, make well, it I really do. work. I, I come up with big picture, crazy ideas. And I have to implement them. And then she has to figure out how to make it work. Like the project that I told you we're working on, you know, the and I just, I said, this is what I want. And she's like, it doesn't exist. And I said, but it's what I want. And then she talks yeah. to the tech guys. Mm -hmm. And now I'm looking at 
demos of exactly what I asked for in the way that I asked. Awesome. And sometimes she goes, we can't do that. That's not going to happen. And then I go, are you sure? And then the next day it's there. So you're, you're, awesome. bas you're, she's basically Steve Wozniak and you're Steve Jobs. Yes. So that's, yes. that's pretty cool. <laughs> you can go fuck yourself. That's <laughs> pretty cool. <laughs> I knew that was coming. That's, uh, <laughs> she can't, but she doesn't want to deal. She doesn't want, she doesn't like dealing with like the agent stuff. I have to deal with that. She doesn't like dealing with, you know, all that non, you know, with all the non, she deals with nuts and bolts. Got it. Okay. And what, what was your background, Sandy? I know Mike talked a little bit about his, but what was your background? I have a degree in economics and an MBA. Oh. And I started wow. my career as a stockbroker. And then I, I got into marketing in 1999 for a newspaper. I sold dial-up internet access on wow. CD-ROMs. Um, that is amazing. <laughs> and uh, we used to hold seminars where I taught old people what hyperlinks were and how to navigate a web browser. Um, <laughs> that's, that's where that's, I that is amazing. To deal with the public <laughs> and um, in groups and, and marketing. And marketing is everything that we do. Um, Absolutely. I've got, I've got a, a weird interlude in the middle. I owned a Puerto Rican restaurant. Um, Long story. Yeah. Wow. And then I ran a comic book shop um, in Orlando, yes. Sci Fi City. And then I opened a <laughs> comic book store in 2007. And um, Mike. Is that, where, is that where you guys met? Because I know Mike had a comic book that. store. Yeah. yeah. So that's, I didn't that's, have a comic store at that point in time. So the story is that Sandy had opened up this comic book store in, in Fort Lauderdale. And after a year, they it, the, the, with the audacity of not even seeking him out for guidance would, ahead of time, would, would right? You stop like it. who who is this person opening a store in my she came, town? She came to my 2007 oh. show, my second supercon, but it was really my third show. So the 2006 show we talked about, I saw all these people who were in a voice actors at the first show, and so I threw together. I had a show booked, or I, I worked out a show. The next show was going to be June, in for Auderdale at a hotel. But then I was like, I got to do something in between to make more money. So I threw together a convention. Now, mind you, I just did the November show. The first show was November 3 through 5. Right after that show, I went and booked dates for April 13 through 15. Pulled off my second show with November, December, January, February, March, you know, five months, right? And the second show was called an anime supercon where I brought in a bunch of anime voice actors and I brought in all the Aqua Teen guys. Oh, oh is yeah. That, is that where you met Dana Snyder? Yeah, is when that's, you, oh, yeah. Okay. And then that show drew 2,400 people. That's incredible. And, wow. And then my third show, which was the second Supercon, <clears throat> was in June, which was three, you know, three months later. And that was the Batman show with Kevin Conroy. Oh, wow. Uh, and, that, that's, and so Sandy came to that show with her partner in the comic store to look around and talk to people and tell them we're opening, we've just opened a store, we're opening a store, we've got something to do with a store. And I was like, oh, look at these people walking around, handing out things on my show, rah, 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 rah. And, uh, <laughs> and so afterwards I, I went into the store, I introduced myself and said, hey, I do the Supercon shows, I've got a show coming up. I had my next show coming up in November, November again. And I was like, you should set up on my show. With Peter Mayhew. Yeah. So, <laughs> So I walked in her store. That's how I met. That's amazing. That's awesome. He walked now, in my store. He talked to me for a little bit. And then he told me I was doing everything wrong. I, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I'm shocked that when you came to the th sh third show, I'm shocked he didn't, come, you didn't, he didn't walk up to you and go, I can buy your business partner out. Thank you. Bye-bye. And walk away. No, so, I never money. I was no, broke. No, he was still oh. broke. Oh, you were still oh, broke. Anyway. Got it. Okay. So, okay. He, oh, no, there he, was no money. You, I've, I'm shocked you didn't walk up to him and say, I could buy you. Give me a couple of years, but I will I buy you. Oh, what we, I was driving. We've, been, we've been mostly broke until last year. You want to tell him what I was driving? No, please, let's hear was it. it. A K car? It wasn't a K car. It was like a, it, like a Cavalier. Might as well have been. It, it was a Cavalier. It was like an old fucking Cavalier. It was like a, a Chevy Cavalier. It was like a 99 <laughs> Cavalier. In like That's amazing. Seven. <laughs> You know, it's so funny that you say that. So, you, you know, I, the financial element, a lot of people think this is a dreamlike industry, meaning, oh, it's it's success. You're making tons of money. It's, you know, it's no. endless amounts of wealth. It's 
farthest from that. There's a lot of agents that live from gig to gig. Um, the industry can be draining constantly. And you constantly have this feeling that, you know, should I give up? One of my favorite quotes that you ever uh, made, Sandy, was, and I'm going to paraphrase it, but you once said that this isn't a passion, it's an obsession. And yeah. I, I, it, I, I, I stand by that quote. And it's exactly what pushes me to the next gig. It, it's what pushes me to drive forward. Is there any regrets that you guys have by doing this? I, I mean, I know that you, you guys are obsessive of this. Both of you are passionately obsessive. Are there any regrets by working in this business? I mean, I think that there are things that when you have the opportunity to slow down a little bit, you realize maybe if we could incorporate a little more stillness and a little more peace of mind into this, then maybe we could feel better while we do it. Obsession doesn't feel very good. It doesn't. Yeah, that's true. It doesn't. And I got And I have to tell you that up until this forced quarantine, we've been running. Absolutely. Nonstop. Me since 06, her with me since 08. Nonstop. And so. And I had a full-time job. I mean, I mentioned before I had an MBA. In 20, until, was, until 2014. I was working as a mobile director in a media company, getting TV stations and newspapers and radio stations into, the, into mobile apps and other mobile services. And so I was, I worked with um, WSBT in South Bend. You mentioned earlier, you went to Notre Dame, Chris. Yeah. So I, the Shures communications company um, is based there. And I used to fly in and out of South Bend all the time um, and fly all, all Alaska. Um, what was that place in California? El Centro, California, right across from Mexicali. All these tiny, yeah. weird little towns, uh, Wichita, <laughs> um, Danville, Kentucky. Wow. And I, I would teach these little properties, um, some were mid-sized, but some of the newspapers were tiny, how to how to be mobile. And what was funny, the, I mean, just a sidebar, I'd have meetings with the newspaper editors and they're like, it's never, people aren't gonna stop reading the newspaper. And I was like, how did you get your news this morning? Cause they were all in a hotel and they're like on our phones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. it's different because we're in a hotel. It's like the people that yeah. thought radio was never going to go away. Yeah. So it's exactly yeah, that. Right. And, and so I was working that full time job for fifty hours a week and helping him for twenty to thirty hours on top wow. of that. Wow! And that wow. that really started in like late oh eight, no oh nine, early oh nine. I mean, that's the in one. Twenty fourteen. I told him that I had to pick one. And that if he hit a, a certain number in 2014, that I was going to quit my job. And um, I, I think we barely crossed that number. I was high fiving everybody. I was like, I quit. <laughs> I, it, was it was it a very stressful moment for you to pick and decide? You know, I it's I either do this full time or I don't do that anymore. I mean, I'm I'm sure that moment was such a, a, a such an important moment in your life. Well, I think the hardest part about working together when you're married is that it's very difficult to separate the emotion from the work. And so I have this constant feeling that I'll disappoint him if I don't come through with something. And, you know, there's just this, it's different than if you work for somebody, be like, it'll get done when it gets done. Well, that for me, if he is the least bit unhappy that it's not there yet, then it upsets me. And so that's part of where the obsession comes in too. And so really I was, it was not hard to give up the other stuff because I was waking up thinking about the shows and going to bed thinking about the shows, but I'd wake up with all these ideas for what I could do to help the business, but I couldn't start on them till six o'clock. And then by <laughs> then I was exhausted. And so I was never really giving what we do a fair shake. And then he was like, I can't afford you. I mean, I had a great job. And I was like, I'll eat lentils, it's fine. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Uh, that that's one of the things about this forced quarantine. I mean, it's it's sort of a blessing and a curse. I, uh, well, <laughs> no. But I, I, Someone I told you she really likes lentils. Oh, uh, does she, she like lentils? lentils? Really yeah. like lentils. Uh, that and you know the the blessing's not lentils, but I mean I'm glad that you do that. I can send you some, <laughs> Sandy. But uh, what that's one of the blessings and curses of this forced quarantine is it really has taught us how to sort of normalize our lives a little bit because i think a lot of us weren't working to live a full life right. and that's one of the things what? i love about your facebook sandy is that i'm constantly sharing your articles and sharing those posts is because 
you are constantly trying to find that full life, you know, living a stable and balanced life. And that's such a hard thing to do in our industry. Um, I know Chris and I never sleep. You know, you can message no. us. At well, now, even now we don't. But no, not really. <laughs> but yeah, even then, even less so. But, you, you know, you could have messaged us at four in the morning and we'd be up. I mean, so. That's true. I guess well, the I'm up. I was up until six last night. This yeah. whole thing has thrown my my inner, internal clock like way off. But what I was going to say is go back a step. Is that you know it's funny we I think all of us in this business we're all running and doing stuff all the time. This is actually kind of like our mini vacation. You know, even though we could stay at home, we get to kind of hang out and just chill and you know do things that probably we otherwise wouldn't have been able to do. Like you know maybe clean around the house or do a project or something. Cause certainly Nuri and I are constantly on airplanes and yeah. you know, flying somewhere. And I know I mean, you guys are always working. And it was we're always working. I know you guys we're are still, still working. working 40, well, 50 well, hours a week right well, now. Two weeks right. ago, I woke up and I was like, all right, I got to come up with a new business model. Right. And you <laughs> yeah, know, that, exactly. that's, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, we are in the middle of the quarantine. You sort of have to rebrand yourself. You got to become Madonna basically and figure out another way to survive. Yeah. So how, what 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 are you doing? What are your thoughts for the future? I'm gonna I'm gonna start wearing that spiky bra. Madonna thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'll start wearing the spiky bra too. Okay. And then we could, you know. We'll we'll take that online. Yeah, that, we're gonna take that. Online. <laughs> That's good. All all we need is uh, GalaxyCon branded spiky Madonna things. That's That'll right. be perfect. That'll be perfect. Yeah. Well, we I mean, you, uh, when this thing are, are your sorry good or are what. No, no, I was going to say, are your days now like the like exactly how they were in between cons? No. Like, do you still no. do all the same no. stuff? Or No. We're I mean, obviously, mine is going outside. No, stuff. I mean, every day. So in between cons, when we when everything was going according to plan, you know, we have four shows a year. So, you know, you mentioned Raleigh, Richmond, Minneapolis. We had been doing Louisville. And we were going to move the Louisville show to Columbus this year. And we postponed that. And now we're looking at doing it next year. So the... You, know, you just scooped that for the entire world. Nobody yes. knew that. <laughs> yes. And we Love have it right Live. here on <laughs> Love Works Live. There you go. <laughs> oh, we're the show, right? And the, but in between shows, all we're doing is show ends. We're cleaning up from the show. We're getting the assets online, the videos, the photos, you know, making sure that everything's paid up. And then we're going and then we're moving into the next show and we're constantly right. working three, four shows ahead. So I'm booking talent every day from multiple shows. We're running advertising every day from multiple shows. So like, you know, right now we would be running ads on a schedule for Raleigh, which would be coming up in, you know, end of July. Uh, if we had been doing the, you know, Louisville or Columbus show, we'd be working on that. We'd be working on Minneapolis and we'd be launching ticket sales, exhibitor sales and, and stuff for, for Richmond 2021. Mm -hmm. All that came to a standstill. Right. We had, you know, at the beginning, of, you know, we, there's 13 of us in the office that were working full time on this goal. And you wake up and you're like, okay, well, we can't, there's no promoting anything right now. We're not going to run any ads for a show that may or may not happen, or if it does happen, may not happen in the way that, you know, it usually does. And a Who lot of people in the industry are arguing that it's bad taste to promote a show uh, that when many other shows are not going to be able to take place. Is that one of your beliefs is that it's bad taste to start advertising I this early? Poor taste to advertise something that may or may not happen with people that may or may not show up. And I think for anybody to say, we're going to have a show on this date in this venue with these guests in the immediate future. Yeah. Right now without any, I think it's difficult. Yeah. I, I understand that people have to promote, they have to, you know, they have to keep, they're trying to keep their business alive. I have friends that are promoting things that are happening. I, I don't judge them for doing that in the short term. I think maybe some people are promoting some things in mid, you know, 2021. It's a little awkward. Maybe let's get through some of this before you start. Absolutely. 2020. No, 2021. Uh, and you there know, it promoting, there are people promoting for shows 
in for first next year. quarter of 2021. Well, that's fine. Those are likely to happen. But I think there's a there's a moment, and I, I'm gonna, I'm going to say something, and I think I understand. There's a moment where a lot of people are suffering. I think we're sort of in the grieving process right now. What would have happened this year? And a lot of people are promoting things, and it seems to be sort of a. I think act. a lot of it's pie in the sky. Absolutely, I think a lot of it is fantasy land. I, I agree. Think saying that you're going to have a, a, an actor from England, a big name actor from England, doing a show in June in the United States is challenging. I don't know that anybody is going to fly from England to the United States in June of this year. I just don't see it happening. Yeah, it's not going to happen. I, I find it difficult for people to see people promoting and spending money and advertising and trying to go after, you know, trying to push for people's money for an event that may or may not, you know, we all hope it happens. We're hopeful Raleigh happens. I don't know. Am I right. going to, you know, give up? No. But am I going no. to actively spend money and be adding new guests right now? No, not until I get more understanding of what the landscape is going to look like and what I'm going to be allowed to do in that city, in that building. Uh, absolutely. And I, I love that you're, that that's your mindset because it, it is given other people now currently, I, I would like to focus on the present and I know you guys are doing the virtual con element or you're trying to work towards that, right? Um, what we're doing, we're doing right now. We, when this thing started, we started doing a live stream every night. You know, like this, where we just bring on talent. We talk to them every day. And I've been doing it Monday through Friday, and it's just to keep, you know, we've had some great guests. You know, uh, you know, Jonathan Frax was on the other day, just had Gates McFadden on, just had Barry Boswick and Alan Ruck on, um, you know, Richard Horvitz and Dana Snyder's on a bunch of times with me, and Brian O'Howard's mm -hmm. been on, and, and, and we're just doing that to kind of normalize everything and, and keep. Dana just texted me and told me that our marriage is actually legitimate. Um, <laughs> Dana Snyder was the minister of our wedding. And and it's incredible. Oh, sent me his corgi card. Yeah, I, I'm He's shocked. That Dana is amazing. You know what? I, I'm shocked. Dana Snyder can text somebody because I, whenever we send him an email and try to get him as a client, like he told me to, he never responds. So that's you know, incredible. He, that he wants to talk to you, and then he just. Kind of, uh, uh, you know, he's always like, yeah, yeah, Nary, okay, we're going to talk. We're going to we're gonna talk. Well, I'll email you. I'll email you. I love Dana, man. He's great. Yeah. No, he's uh, incredible. But yeah, he never emails. So <laughs> it's just funny. I can't explain it. And uh, so we've been doing that and we're working towards some other stuff. And, you know, we'll be launching probably tomorrow. And it's announcing everything tomorrow. It's incredible. I mean, we're looking forward to any announcements that you guys have coming up. Um, but it's uh, not its not the end of the world. The, 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 the industry will survive. Everything will survive. It'll just be changed for the short term. We'll yeah, it's going to take a little while. No. Anybody who thought San Diego Comic-Con with 135,000 people was going to happen this year, you know, yeah, no it's way. illogical. You know, Anime Expo yeah. with, you know, it's illogical. But events will happen. More people will start to come in. And as time goes and vaccines come into play, and more people will go to events. Absolutely. So for the short term, That's true. maybe events are a little smaller. Maybe events come back a little slower, a little smaller, and we build back up again. Maybe. And, and you know what? This is the kind of thing that, you know, it, we might lose some talent to doing shows, meaning – uh, you know, we have some older talent that will not be able to do a show until a vaccine happens. But right. it, I would rather have that person be safe. And I think you guys agree Hell with yeah. this. Rather Absolutely. have that person be safe because the last thing I think anybody wants is to have, a, a you know, a, a celebrity go to a show and, and catch. Timer leaves his house before there's a vaccine to do a show with you. I'm going to come to your house and murder you. Uh, he, <laughs> you he, don't, don't he won't. You put that don't you put that man at risk. I will never. No, it won't no, he's, happen. He's a treasure. He's a, he, he'll call you he's that. He's a treasure to us too. Trust me. Yeah, he's a treasure. He He's a very treasure, but I mean, other than that, he's a treasure. <laughs> and, you know. Wow. He, 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 he told me that joke. That's him. You know. And Margaret he, Perry just got married. I know. Isn't that incredible? So, She's almost, yeah. almost 90 and she got married f to her high and school. She moved to Florida. What? And she moved to Florida. Sweetheart. She moved to Florida. Yes. Yeah, yeah, well, high school sweetheart. You're 90. 
He goes and, Florida. And, you know, he reached out after so many years of not talking to her and said, hey, I, you know, I don't know if you remember. She goes, of course I remember you. And they started talking and, you know, fell back in love again. I mean, that's a true wow. Disney story. Yes. Right? Yeah. And a- now she's in Florida, Mike. So now we, you know, get on that. That'll be something good. I think she's, uh, oh. she's, she's looking to do something. So. That'll be fun. Somebody asked a question. Your mom's watching. Oh, my mom's watching. It's great. <laughs> Hi, mom. Um, somebody asked a question <laughs> earlier, and uh, I, I don't. We are, can't put them on. I can't screen. get. It. I can't. I'm. Well, tell me. No, I can put them on. Somebody asked. Not Michael Reiser. Somebody asked about. Um, there we go. Stop. Chris Wilcock, advice for smaller shows. You guys run great shows. Blah blah. We love to do them as vendors. As murder, what advertising do you find works the best? Hope you're staying safe. This you could take it off screen. This gets back to the conversation we're having earlier about not having any money. Throughout the history of everything we've done, we just advertise and promote from day one when I was delivering pizzas to get money to make flyers until yesterday, you know, until this thing started. Everything's about promotion. Anybody who's running a show, the only thing between success and not success is advertise is marketing, is promotion. So if you're not going out and doing, you don't need any money. You need flyers. Our buddy Wingy, okay, this is a perfect example. Wingy um, used to work for us. You know Wingy. Yeah, and he, Wingy, he pulled off a great first show. Wingy worked for me for a couple of years, was great. And he, when last year, just before we sold uh, the Miami show to Reed Pop, he decided he was going to leave. He knew the sale was coming. He decided he was going to leave. That was his time for him to exit. He just was burnt out and just wanted to, you know, live his own life. He decided he was going to start his own convention, a Taku Fest in Miami at the Miami uh, Airport Convention Center. And this is a year ago. And Winji didn't have any money. Winji had been working had been working for me, and he was paid, I mean, well enough. But I, you know, it, it, look, it's he wasn't making you know a fortune. He started putting together his show and. And his first show, first ever show, with a, a minor guest list. It wasn't anything spectacular, right? Um, I, had two, I had two of my clients there. They were spectacular. I, right, I'm, but it was, a, it was a small anime, you know, uh, anime, yeah, I get what you're animation saying. bent show in Miami, Labor Day weekend, the same weekend as Dragon Con, during a, a, a supposed hurricane, because there was it a hurricane. wasn't Labor Day weekend. Wasn't it Labor Day weekend? It was Labor Day weekend. Wasn't no. it Labor Day weekend? I think it was Labor Day weekend. It was what? during. It was same the weekend. same weekend as Dragon Con. Yeah, same, yeah, it was Labor Day weekend. Yeah, same, yeah. same weekend as Dragon Con, and then a hurricane yeah. happened, right. and the I hurricane was coming, and hurricane. everybody was freaking out that they were going to have to cancel the guests. Absolutely. And, and the hurricane never actually oh, hit. That's right. But everyone was scared this hurricane was coming. In the midst of a hurricane scare, which was supposed to be a cat five and destroy the town, he drew forty five hundred people. Incredible. He did it because he wow. went out. It was the largest first time show in Florida's history. That's incredible. And he did it That's because insane. he went out, he pounded the pavement, he handed out flyers at movie theaters, he handed out flyers at other events. He, sh- him personally, went out every day to coffee houses, to, to any geek event in town. And he did some social media stuff. He did, he spent a little bit of money advertising, but not, not a lot in the overall scheme of things. And, but he hustled, and and if you, I too many people start shows because they want to say they're a show promoter. Too many people yeah. start a show because they're a fan and they're like, oh, this is about me, and I just need to book the guests and people are going to show up. And I can't tell you how many people over the years said, oh well, you know, I'm going to draw ten thousand people because I put I got a comic, couple comic book stores to put flyers out on the table, and I'm like, really. You realize those comic book stores are going to take the flyers when you leave the store, either throw them in the garbage or they're going to put them on a flyer rack where they're going to collect dust by the front of the store. And the comic store is what? Going to have a couple hundred customers coming through in a month. It's not, you know, even if a store has 150 subscribers, you know, maybe we'll say three, 400 customers in a week. That's not enough to get a, you know, what's, what's your, so too many people don't hustle. They don't work hard enough. They don't promote. And the, and the, and the core part the word promoter, we're promoters, that that word is promote. You have to promote. And so if anybody has a small, I don't care if you have a small show, you have a big show, you just have to promote. And everything we did or that I did and, and then we was take every penny 
and put it back into promoting and growing the show and growing the show and growing the show. So when Sandy says there we wasn't a lot of money, there wasn't a lot of money. There were times where there was more money than others. And then there were times where a show didn't work the way we had planned and there was less money. And, and, and we have lost obscene amounts of money. And then we have made a lot of money and it evens out. Um, but the, the, we wouldn't be here if we didn't promote constantly and put everything back into marketing every step of the way. That's been the hardest part of the quarantine is that as soon as we knew that people were going to have to stay at home and people were starting to lose their jobs and we just stopped asking people for money every day. You know, that's what you do as a promoter. You, you do something online in a creative way that asks people to give you their money in exchange for a lovely experience. Do you, and well, you know, I'm so glad you said that because I actually had an agent call me this weekend and sort of guilt me into not doing a virtual con. And I said, let, let me explain to you that by having my client do that, and like, unless it's in a very dire circumstance of having our client do it, if I have my client do that, we're taking away money from families that need it. We're taking away money for people that need to pay rent. And it's, it's also that obsessive, obsessive thing. A lot of these fans are obsessive. They want to support our clients. So why give them the opportunity for them to decide, okay, do I eat? Do I support my family this month? Or do I buy an autograph? So that was one of the things that I'm sort of, we're struggling with constantly as we go through this. Now, thankfully, there is a percentage of people that are working right now. But um, my, my the hope- stimulus checks have come in now. Right, exactly. And the, there's a federal match on the unemployment. And right. there are some people right now who are making more on unemployment well, than they were I'll making tell you before. you a funny story, right. So I, you're right. Yeah, we, I had the exact same attitude as you until this last week. Until this last week, exactly. Right. Now it's different. Now things have right. changed. Now it's getting back to normalizing things. And there are people who are suffering and that sucks and we hate that. But there are people who are bored who want human connection, Absolutely. who are fans, yeah. and who that's how, that's how, through fandom is how they get their, their most uplifting connections. And so it's important to be there for those people while we also provide a free service for people who can't afford to do some other things. And so we're, you know, we're walking that right. tightrope. And, and the, when we're talking about doing a digital thing, there will be a mix. There will be a free component and there will be a paid component. And there will be something for people who can, and there are some people who cannot. The and that's very important um, is that there's a there's a there's an entry point. And I think in everything that we've done, we've tried to be uh, is the word egalitarian. Is that the right word? I mean, what I've always tried to be able to provide an experience for people who had little money, and provide an experience for people who have a lot of money. And as we've gotten bigger, it's been it's. There are challenges along the way, but I always, you know, when my mother used to take me to shows, conventions when I was younger, we didn't have a lot of money. So it was a big deal to buy the ticket to get in. And so there, there's always been a lot of programming at my shows, right? The reason for that is I always want to say that you can just have an amazing time for the value of your ticket and that you can buy all the celebrity products, you can do all the other things, but if somebody spends... $30, $50 to get into my show, that might be all they have. And so I want them to be able to have a full day. And it's like Disney World. You buy a ticket to get in, although Disney World is much more expensive. You don't have to buy anything else. You can. You don't have to. Um, Mike, that's what with, I want to say this, something. That That's one of the things I've always appreciated about you is that I, I've always seen your vision of what you wanted to do or pull off at your show to create an experience for people that not maybe that's affordable and that families can afford. And I've met your family. I, I, I love Ian. I've met your mom. The, all wonderful people. You're the one. Uh, well, <laughs> now Ian's one of the, I mean, I truly a good person and all your I entire family. Is, I think he's great. They're good people. And I'm not saying I, this to just blow you. I'm saying yeah, it because true. these people made, I assume an impact in your life, and that's why you're doing this. Did your mom have any I role? I didn't know Ian ten years ago. Oh, you didn't really. Ian's my half brother. Oh, from my okay. dad's first. Wife. Okay. So Ian is not. You've met my mother. They're not related. My really? dad. Ian's my dad's son from a previous marriage. So I have I have these five half brothers and sisters that I never knew until about 2010. 
And then I met Ian for the first time, and then he just kind of won't leave. <laughs> it's, it's amazing, though. No, that's great. So I, you you no, really do have great. that family element, though. I it, it's something that I you know it's something that we've talked about. It's something that I see at your shows. But but it was but it was I, my mother was a single mother, and so growing up, it was just me and my mom and my grandmother early on, and, and you know, and then my grandmother was always around. But it was my grandmother and my mother and me, and that was it. And so. You know, I know what it's like for a, you know, we didn't have a lot. So why, but she would take me to these shows. And so there was not a lot of disposable income. So it, it it's very important to me that people can have a good, have a, an experience, you know, without having to buy an autograph or a photo op or anything. And so when we go into the digital thing, again, it's, there's a, there's a mix that being said, the last week or so, people are getting their stimulus checks. People are getting their unemployment checks. People are getting that unemployment bonus check. I mean, yes, it's terrible. There's twenty some odd percent, twenty percent of the of the of America is unemployed right now. It is my sincere hope, dream, wish, and I think all of us that when things start to get to back to some some sort of normalcy, be it in two weeks, be it in a month, be it in two months those jobs start coming back and people start being able to go to work, right? I mean, just think about all the people in our business, people who run the convention centers, people who run the hotels, people the who, AV, the AV people, the security companies, you know, in, in live events and in, in sporting events, forget about the freaking millionaire football players. Think about the people who are the ushers yeah. or work in the concession, concession stands yeah. in the stadiums. Those are the people that are without jobs right now that need help. The good thing is that the government, is is giving people a lot of money and and i've heard people getting their stimulus checks and it's a lot it's 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 a good amount of money and so i'm i'm happy to see things are moving and hopefully things hopefully it helps i i don't know because i don't have a crystal ball um but yeah I know I, I stand for it and you know anything you guys do, uh, Chris and I will always support you guys. It's something that you guys, I don't know, it seems like you guys touch magic wherever you go. Um, uh, with but, regard- But, but Neary, but, you're, but it's, it's the, the word is uh, compassionate capitalism? What is it? How did, what is the term? I, we like to use the word compassionate capitalism. That's your term, it's conscious capitalism. Conscious capitalism. I, see, There's I love that. Capitalism, right? Like I'm very much a capitalist, right? Like I believe it. Like, although I think that capitalism is going to take a big hit during this, and I think you know socialism is going to be on an upswing right now because it has to, and there's a place for that. I very, very much. Believe I mean, that's in, what a stimulus check is. It's right. Socialism. I very much believe in, in socialism, social, you know, uh, programs to help safety nets. safety nets. But I also believe in people going out and making a business for themselves and making money such as yourselves. You guys are entrepreneurs. You have your own business. You guys are forging your own path. I'm trying, we're trying to forge a path. And, you know, the, uh, and we all help people make money. But I believe that while making money, you have to, you have to have a heart and a soul. And I think, you know, sometimes people lose that. And especially in this business. Agreed. And that's something Chris and I strive for. It's something you guys strive for. I mean, conscious Absolutely. capitalism is something that I think everybody needs to have somewhere in their body. I mean, I don't know. Right. I wish more people did. Um, how do you guys determine on? How do you determine which guests you bring to a show? I mean, I, I, you, you sort of also deal with your fandom. Your fan, you're a fan of a lot of things, Mike. So, how do you determine to bring a guest to a show? I typically don't bring guests in based on my own fandom. Um, if if I did, he's a fan of weird stuff. If I if you if, <laughs> if I book people based on what I like, I'd be running Streets of Fire conventions with all of Sean Clark. <laughs> and, that's awesome. And you know it. I've never had any of those guys. That, like that's like one of my top five movies. Michael Paré. Is that should, Michael Paré? Michael, Michael, right? Michael Paré. Yeah. I've never had Michael yeah. Paré show. But so that <laughs> he would be a like great I had dad. David Warner on a show once. I had David Warner once. It was like my favorite villain of the 80s. Was it because of Tron, right? Yeah. I assume. Was it Tron? Time Bandit. Time Bandit. Tron. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's, he's, he's uh, Star Trek 6. He's in so many things, right? And uh, 
I just love David Warner, but I've only had him once. So I, I book for my audience. I book for people who buy tickets and I'm booking and I book across the spectrum. My thing has always been, I'm trying to book for young, you know, uh, teenagers, adults, and then, and then older people. I want mom, dad, the kids and grandparents to all have somebody at the show that they want to meet. So you see Henry Winkler over here, he's appealing to a very specific audience. Richard Dreyfus is appealing to a very specific audience, but then you got the My Hero Academia people in, over in a corner and you got Mickey Mouse over here. And everybody, you know, Alan Oppenheimer appeals to a very specific age group, right? Yeah. Right? It's 40 year old, 40 to 50 year old men. You'd be surprised though, because Falcor, I mean, <laughs> never ending stories played right. such Falcor. a large, yes. yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's I mean, fair. A lot of younger people are walking up to him because they want to meet Falcor. So that's that's, that's kind of nice, you know. But like, um, you know, you got the image from the I guess that's the Raleigh show, where you've got ET. Well, that's all my generation of people who grew up, and then you've got you know the Clerks guys who, again, is I only, us, I only, oh, that's all great, yeah. Mike. But I only put put that graphic up for one reason. It's because the first time my guy is literally on the Richard front, Karn. Richard Karn. That's the only reason that's even up there, Mike. Don't, don't, don't all, everything else, that's great. But Richard but Karn, home improvement. So. What do you see in that image? You see a bunch of anime people, a bunch of voice actors, and you don't just see, you know, one set of anime, you know, animation voice actors. You see anime people, you see the guy from, you know, uh, 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 Peanuts, you see Goofy's on there. Yeah, yeah and, goofy and Max. There. Max is there too. Yeah, no, I know. And that you that's covered up Faraman. Well, okay. Well, that's not the point. The point is that you know <laughs> you guys put on great shows, and that's the reason I put that graphic up is because it really does illustrate you guys take the voiceover talent and make them headliners in an event. They're mixed well, with the on, on screen guys. We've had a conversation. I had a conversation with a promoter once who asked me how I book voice actors. And I go, well, this is how I do it. And he goes, how many do you book? And I go, oh, well, like 35. And uh, and he goes, oh, we usually bring in like five. And I said, yeah, that's great. Here's why I bring in 35. Because just because you're, just because you're a fan of My Hero Academia doesn't mean, you know, Disney, Disney voice actors are a completely different audience than Praise anime. you, Mike, praise you, because you That's are the true. reason, and I use your show as an example. Whenever a promoter contacts us and they say, well, we've got five voice actors. We don't need any more voice actors. I'm like, why the hell do you think that the My Hero, your five My Hero Academia guys are not going to match my Mickey and Goofy guys, okay? Alan Oppenheimer does not compete against Justin Briner, okay? It's no, totally different Alan audiences. Totally different audience, right? Like, totally different, different audience. Even, even Never ending story audience isn't the My Hero Academia audience. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Not at all. And and the goofy, you know, Max, Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, or Disney Princess, you know, Lance's Disney Princesses. Totally different <laughs> audience. Totally different audience. Yeah. Totally, and totally different that. audience. And even your G.I. Joe guys, you know, and the old school G.I. Joe guys. Keone, Keone, and and Morgan and uh you know, the we, others. We have people travel up to 500 miles or more to meet just the G.I. Joe guys. Like, that's that's the kind of power yeah, that we're, we're so happy to have with our guys. Because our, every, every, we we specify, uh, specialize in people that do not compete against each other. So, like, that's one of the arguments I never understand at a Comic-Con for guests. My voice actors are not going to compete against another agent's voice actors. It's a totally different realm. And I'm so glad you see that. You know. And and Tara Strong and Tom Kenny and Kevin Conroy are just as much headliners Absolutely. as any Absolutely. face actor. You know, ninety any and ninety percent of the face actors on the planet, or Tara even Strong, more so. Tara, you know, Tara Strong is going to have longer lines than ninety percent of the of the face actors at my show. Yeah, at, at, yeah. at any show. Um, Kevin Conroy's gonna is a monster guest. Um, always has huge lines. Always too. has huge lines. Oh, yeah, he monster guests. I mean, Justin Roiland. You, you know, oh, yeah. Justin. Oh Roiland. God, yeah, Rick and Morty. Well, when we had him in Raleigh, just never ended. Just yeah. didn't yeah. stop. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's huge. it's it's just. That's but other people don't see it because they don't. It's the problem with other promoters again. 
I have no idea what half this stuff is. I don't watch My Hero Academia. I've never seen a goofy movie. <laughs> never seen it. I know who the character is. just broke Mary's heart. <laughs> Hang on. But, but Mary, I'm 45 years old. I don't care. It's the 25th <laughs> anniversary. You have Disney Plus. You should go right now and watch it. But when I watch Disney Plus, I put on old Robin Hood. So do, I, yeah. so do I. So do I. But why does that stop you from watching a goofy movie? You'll cry, we, Mike. You will cry. At we the put end on of that Darby O'Gill and the Little People. I, I don't want to know that you I watch Darby O'Gill and the Little People. I, I love that movie. Pete's Dragon. <laughs> Pete's Dragon, of yeah, course. Pete's Mickey Dragon. Rooney, of course, of course. But, but you, you watching Mickey uh, Rooney all night is not going to stop you from watching Goofy and Max go okay. on an adventure. So okay. like, you know which one I bet you like, Mike. I bet you like Condor Man. I love Remember Condor, Condor Man. Man? Look, yeah. I'm, I'm tired of all of your old yeller nonsense, guys. Please, please. <laughs> I love old yeller like, too. He doesn't understand. He doesn't get it. <laughs> Sandy liked old yeller. I love old like yeller. Glasses. I love old Who yeller. Who doesn't cry at old Sandy yeller? Sandy liked Glasser. Like I, I don't remember Flipper. His Flipper. Name? Flipper. Flipper. <laughs> Faster than lightning. <laughs> No one can I see. Now, now, now I know what guests would have been at your show or the, if, if you kept trying to <laughs> yeah, go. Exactly. Rico Brown from the Creature of the Black Lagoon. He oh. trained Flipper. Oh, yeah. I love Riku. I love Creature of the Black Lagoon. That's that's two, two of the guests that you brought to the show that I love. Wait, you, did you ever bring Julie Adams? No. You brought uh, Riku Browning, right? Never, never got her. Uh, Riku Browning. We did work with Julie Adams numerous times. But Riku Browning, that was the one guest that you brought to a show, Mike, that I was like, kind of fanboying i was like oh that's that's cool the universal monster that's pretty awesome so that's one yeah yeah no yeah you're right he is the last one that's crazy um who, who that that being said who's your favorite convention guest because i mean i i know that you you know bring in people from all types so who it doesn't have you. to be a celebrity I mean, I'll, I'll tell you my favorite guests are, but to finish the other point i don't know who half i don't know i don't watch half the things that I book guests from, I just know who they are and I do my research and learn, right? So I could tell you what all the anime shows are and I know all about Fairy Tale and My Hero Academia and 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 uh, Rosario plus Vampire and I could name you every single show and I could tell you who all the voice actors are in every one. But to me, it's like sports um, um, uh, statistics. It's statistics. I'm I'm, running, I'm doing statistics, yeah. and so. I like to say that when we're booking a show, I'm, I'm playing Moneyball. I don't know if you ever w of read the course, book or watched yeah. the movie. Yeah. yeah. But my enti right. our entire, an entire history of the show has been booking Moneyball. It's like I may not get the biggest names you could ever get, but I'm going to book a bunch of other names that kind of pull in a bigger crowd. Because I, I look at some of the shows that book large, large, big, big, big money guys, and I go, well, you're going to spend all your money on that. Yep. How many fans can that one guest service? I'm, and I'm going to argue with you that I've been to some of those shows, some of these corporate shows with standard operating procedures that have these big time guests, and uh, <laughs> and they're not bringing in the people that you would want uh, to see at these large shows with these large guests. So, right. you know, I, that's one of my arg those that's one of my arguments. So it's when uh, it, and a promoter tells me oh, I don't need your guy, why do I need your guy when I've got Right. A list too high, an A list yeah. too high over here. I'm like, you want to know why? Because the, the 80 percent of your audience can't afford that 300 dollars autograph you have coming through the door that you can only fit right. 400 people. And, and so, your 300 dollars guest, your 300 dollars guest is going to spend eight seconds with a fan, whereas Richard Karn will give a fan a minute or two. Absolutely. And, yeah. And that, absolutely. The story about yeah. how they watched Home Improvement with their grandmother or their uncle and how it meant something to them, right? Not to mention yeah. that our guests, our guests, we have clients that will be there from the beginning of the show when it starts to the end of the show. I can't say that for some of that A-list talent who sometimes leave fans disappointed because they leave two hours early. And that there's numerous shows across the country where that's happened. So. You know, I I'm I feel blessed with who we represent. You know, yeah, we yeah. have to provide people with an opportunity to make memories. Absolutely, and that takes people back to things they're nostalgic for. And you know, those sometimes it's big guests. You know, Josh Brolin would be a big nostalgia guest for me. 
you know, he was Love in Goonies, Goonies and Goonies. Uh, now he's hot again as Thor. And and so that's, you know, from my generation, something I could be nostalgic over who's a big time guest. But it's not often the case that what was hot 20 years ago is super hot A-list now. And there's a lot, there's a there's just so much fun you can have with people who are down to earth and meeting fans because they enjoy it and not doing it just because it's an, another gig. And I love that you said right. that because that one person that you could bring in, right, with a guarantee that's X amount can bring in maybe 20 of these other people that actually craft an experience for your convention that your fan is actually going to want to come back next year because of all the fun they had, not because that your A-list celebrity is not there next year. A lot of those people don't carry over to the following year because they don't want to meet those, you know, that, that one. That A-list person. celebrity is not going to hang out at the bar till three in the morning. Absolutely. That A-list celebrity is not going to hang out at the VIP party. I Much will say that, and I'm going to burst both of your bubbles, that one A-list celebrity can bring in 5,000 attendees yes. for one flight in one weekend worth true. of hotel rooms. Yes. And the lower level guests who are not A-list now, but A-list in our hearts from 20 years ago, <laughs> yeah. each one of them, even though they may not have the same kind of guarantee, you know, they still cost have a cost. flight. They right. still cost yeah. a hotel room all weekend and it racks same up. Same accommodations, so yeah. You know, but, but having it's a such a... It's a, it's a a, a diverse show of geek interests is expensive and we get criticized for how many people we bring in because it's, you know, by other people in the business because they, they just think they probably think we're doing it because we're fans and we, we don't know what half of the shit is. <laughs> right. I've never watched power Rangers in my life. No, but yeah, I mean, either. I think John ADF, <laughs> You know, Walter Jones, Amy Jo Johnson. I can name you all the – I can name Look, you – I just – I know that half the agents that represent the people you're talking about don't know what their client has done. So that's why <laughs> that's why Chris and I try to represent people we know. And one of the things, Mike, and I think I found the success in pitching this to you and some of the other promoters is I've – all the people we represent, I've, I've watched. Or people I'm fans of. I actually don't represent anybody that I don't – I turn people away constantly because I don't know who they are or I don't know what they've done and I don't know how to sell them. And I think that that's one of the things that makes Chris and I different. And maybe we're idiots because maybe that's why we're not, you know, millionaire agents like some of these well, other maybe, guys. But maybe you need to spend this quarantine watching some more shows so you can grow your client list. May, maybe, maybe, yeah. you know, but um, if you're up till four or six in the morning, maybe you need to take in. Working. I'm working, Sam. <laughs> You know, that's what I was doing. <laughs> you know, I you know again, I would say it again. What I would reiterate what Sandy says: we're we're in the making memories. Sandy likes to say we're in the happiness business. I love it. And and if Richard Karn is going to make somebody happy, or if Austin St. John is going to make somebody happy, I mean, I can't tell you how many people I've seen go up to Austin or or JDF or or any of the Rangers and be like, "Oh my God, my entire life I've been waiting for this moment," right? And I, I know nothing about Power Rangers. I just know that it elicits responses from fans. So it's my job as a promoter to know who all these who all these guys are and what all these shows are and who's on the circuit to try and find people for my fans. Absolutely. Like when you got actually Eckstein, right? Like I've never watched an episode of the Star Wars cartoons. Well, I remember what I said to you. I was like, it's really good, actually. Ask, ask your staff members. And I, I think you called me within two minutes and was like... But once I knew who, who the character was, yeah, I, I understood. Okay. Once I got who that was, and I was like, yeah, absolutely. Uh, My dad's uh, watching Betty Boop in the other room. I love it. <laughs> Betty Boop. Um, it, it's funny because when we, when we do this, you know, on our side for Nuri and I, we get it a lot where it's not every client, but every once in a while we'll get a client where they go, well, my autograph is worth this much, or they're really concerned about how much their autograph is worth or how much it, is, it goes for on the secondary market. And we tell them a lot. We say, hey, look, you know, you're not there to sell your autograph. You're selling you and you're selling yeah. your experience of meeting you. Right. The autograph, That's what it is. The autograph is it's, almost meaningless. 
Yeah, it's irrelevant. I mean, all it is is they put it on the wall. Somebody walks in and goes, oh, you met so-and-so? And then they tell the story about how right. they were cool and they met the person. Right. The, the, autograph, yeah. the autograph is the MacGuffin. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. That's, That's perfect. 100%. That's a perfect way of saying it. Yes. There yep. has to be a, an, a reason why the fan is coming to the table to transact, right? And so the autograph is the transaction or the photo, right? The fan just wants to meet the guest. The autograph is just the the memento from the meeting. If they wanted right. the autograph, they could go on eBay and buy it from your eBay store and be done with it. Yep. Right? True. Every yeah. single guest you have, their autographs are on your eBay store. And yeah. half the planets, you know, half the eBay stores on the planet. They don't want Kenny James says he doesn't even go to lunch. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> That's true. He doesn't. He doesn't. Kenny's Bowser. We just Kenny, Kenny's yeah. a good example. Kenny James is Bowser. Bowser is such an iconic character, right? Everybody knows who Bowser is from you know Nintendo and Mario and all that stuff, right? So people get to meet Bowser. They get Bow Kenny to sign an autograph of Bowser. They get to put it on their wall, and then people come over and go. What's with the Bowser picture? Oh, I met the guy who's the voice of Bowser, and they right. got a story, yeah. right? Yeah, and it's it's it's, and with voice actors, the autograph's more important than the photo because at least with a celebrity, you put up the selfie and you're like, oh, look at me with you know Jason Mewes, or look at me with Richard Karn. People know who the face is, but if you put up a picture with you and Kenny, who is that? Your uncle? Yeah. Right, right, right. I understand. I, I, that's one of the. That's one of the things that it. it's a. It, that's a constant battle, I think, with voiceover, and it's something that people are constantly trying to, you know, change. Uh, there are now currently voice actors that are more recognizable than some yeah. of these face actors. So that is changing, and I think yeah. it's just a matter of the tide changing. Um, now I, yeah. that's really inside baseball. You got to know your voice actors. It's true. You've got to be a super fan because. You that, just never know. But that's who we're selling to. A lot of the people are super fans. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking. Right, but they can't but that's brand. not who we're selling to. I understand. I get that. So you can have a super fan show with five to 10,000 people. But once you crack 10,000 people. When you're dealing with 50,000 people, you're dealing with the general public. And it's like the conversation right. we had earlier about a voice actor that we're that should go remain nameless that we talked about before this call. He's selling, he clearly knows that when he goes to a show, he's selling to the general public based on the popularity of his, char his character that he voices or the characters that he voices. He knows that he's going to have a couple of super fans, but he also knows people are going to come in and go, Oh my God, I, oh my God, you're the, you're the voice of that. And then mom, yeah. mom's going to take the kid over and they're going to go get an autograph and they're going to have a moment. Well, this is why we put the characters on the banners. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that's key right. is that you're, you're promote, you know, people want to meet those characters and get a moment with those people that provide the voices for their characters. And that being said, you guys, I'm sure have a favorite convention guest. Who is your favorite convention guest? And Sandy, you have talked less during this and you cannot say Howard Chaykin. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, You know, I, there, I have favorites for different reasons, um, but I'm really deeply appreciative of what Michael Rooker does with his fans uh, and how he treated my family um, and my nephew in particular. And he did the whole Yondu whistle thing and pretended like he had the arrow in his jacket and uh, my six-year-old nephew going nuts. It was really, really, really sweet. Um, that's pretty cool. And, and and the last time he was with us, he really went above and beyond um, because he, he had to make a schedule change. And um, I don't know. I don't know who else would be my favorite. I mean, I, I love John Wesley Shipp. Um, I knew it. I <laughs> love spending time with him. And, you know, I, I have, yeah, I really, I really enjoy seeing Lou. I mean, I have a lot of people who it's nice to see again and again now. Um, yeah. I love busting Shatner's chops when he lets me. Yeah. <laughs> that's good fun. Very few people do, so that's pretty good. No, that's good. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I don't, I don't know. I like the ones who are 
really down to earth. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of Guardians of the Galaxy. And so I, I wish that I could get to know more of those guys, but I, you know, they're super busy and it's hard to connect and, um, but they've all been great. Batista's yeah, been, they've all been wonderful, wonderful and Sean Gunn's wonderful. And I was a huge fan of Gilmore Girls. Really enjoyed meeting Scott Patterson. Yeah. What about you, Mike? What Who's been your favorite convention guest? I mean, you've been doing this for a long time, so. There's, there's again, I have different favorite guests. I can't say there's one favorite guest. And then I can give like reasons of why, you know, um, you'll notice that a lot of the, you know, you'll see a lot of repeats. You know, or you'll see people that travel around, you know, um, you know, William Shatner, having William Shatner do my shows and know who I am makes nine year old me really. <laughs> right? like, that was like when I started having William Shatner was like the, the Mount Everest. Like if you could have William Shatner in your show, that was like the pinnacle. And now I have Shatner all the time. And and, you know. I have had nothing but good, very good interactions with Bill. And I think Bill's great. And, you know, have other people had some some issues? Sure. And I can I can understand why. And I think that half of that is that, you know, Bill Bill just wants things to be done, you know, on a schedule in the right way. And as long as you do work with Bill, Bill's great. And uh yeah. and the fans love meeting him and it shows every show his lines are huge and people come out for him um but yeah i love having channel i love the quirks guys you know brian o'halloran and jay muse and you know i love those movies and and Kevin Smith and having those guys do my shows and know who we are and and they're just super chill cool down-to-earth people uh, you know when we had kevin smith in 2013 um San, San oh my goodness so I got a phone call about a half an hour before he was supposed to be there and my caller ID said Jason Muse. And we had, <laughs> yeah. and, and, then, and we didn't have Jay booked and it was Kevin Smith was booked for the Sunday of our 2013 show to go on at seven o'clock at night after the show ended. Right? Wow. Like, I booked it because I wanted to have a big bang at the end. And okay. so so Kevin just came in to just do the evening with thing, you know, with his 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 Q and A, and so he's he's got to be there for seven o'clock. So it's six thirty, and they're trying to figure out how to get into the building. And he goes, "Hi, this is Jason. I'm with Kevin, and I just want to make sure that we're going to the right place." And and I gave him all the information, and I said, "Jason Muse," and he goes, "Yeah." And I was like, "Okay, I'll see you soon." And I said, and then when I we got there, it was actually really funny because they uh, that was outside of. Maybe they were the only people you'd ever had to the show that I had been a fan of. That up was to that time. Up to that time in 2013. Wow. And then so they were way out behind the building and they couldn't figure out how to get to me. So I ran out to the little red Hyundai that Kevin was driving. And um, I ran maybe a half a mile out to meet them. And then I was pointing which way to drive. He was like, just hop in. And then so 17 year old me, <laughs> I'm riding in the back seat of the car with Kevin and Jason. And, that's pretty uh, cool. It was just really bizarre, and because they were just so chill and normal, and it was just like being in one of their movies. It was such an odd exchange, anyway. And then to ride in the back seat of the car with them to get to this insane thing <laughs> they were doing. I mean, it was totally out of out of a script, and um, so that was fun. Is that was that's pretty cool. We go to Jay and Sandy goes, are you, Jay, Sandy goes to Jay goes, and we didn't know Jay at the time. Like Jay, that was we had never really met Jay. Know any and Sandy goes to Jay, she goes, Are are you gonna go on with Kevin? He goes, Oh no, no, I'm just here to hang out. Oh yeah, that's right. And then Kevin goes on stage and then pulls Jay up on stage with him. Yeah. And the crowd goes ballistic because they were only expecting Kevin. Right. And then they got Kevin and Jay. <clears throat> and this was, you know. Oh, they went nuts. Um, I'm going to answer two questions on the side, or make two. Sure, I was. I would. We we usually take care of these after, but grab them. Tell me what they are, and I'll um, pull them up. I didn't know this. Michael Worker Worker popped up in the kids cosplay contest. Yeah, I read that earlier. I got. Oh, uh, it's so cool. That's really cool. <laughs> like, that's awesome. He did another really cool thing in Richmond where he pulled a Yondu cosplayer up. Um, his little little boy, and 
put him in the director's chair on the stage and started interviewing the kid. Oh, that's so cool. I'm going to, so if we could, I'm going to just pull up some comments. Grown women cried when they realized Margaret Carey was Tinkerbell. That's really nice. Hang on, Neri, uh, one more, one more real quick. Hit me. Rachel says Hillbilly Jim is her favorite person. Okay. So Hillbilly Jim, I brought him in last year, I think, to Raleigh. And it was the first time we ever had him. Growing up, I used to go to wrestling with my mom. She would take me to the WWE shows. And she really liked Hillbilly Jim. I didn't quite understand oh, my why my mom's favorite was Hillbilly Jim till years later. If you look at those old photos of Hillbilly Jim, he is built, right? Like he's a he's a monster. But that was my mom's favorite when we would go. And so uh, I brought him to the show last year. And then J Jimmy Decker is the agent. And uh, and dealing with Jimmy Decker. Oh, my God. I love Jimmy. But, oh, I want to. And uh, so, but we got a picture <laughs> last year with Hillbilly Jim, which, you know, he still looks great. He's still in great shape for, you know, and, uh, but that was cool because it was like my mom enjoyed him, you know, when we were growing up. I, um, my mom was a big uh, fan of uh, Wee Majors. Oh, of course. Uh, the $6 million man. You know that, uh, you know that Oppie's Rudy Wells, right? And the $6 I do. million dollar man. I know. Okay. He's one of the Rudy Wells's, yes. Yes. One, well, only Rudy Wells to me, but okay. The only, keep going he's on. the original. <laughs> he's but, the first one. But I got to have I got to have Lee at a couple of shows. That was really cool. Um, you asked about favorites. Dana Snyder is a favorite because he's a, he's become a very good friend, right? He married you. Know, you. He should be a favorite. <laughs> so like, you know, we become really close, like Austin St. John. We're like buddies with Austin. You know, we're we become really friendly with a lot of these people. So it's difficult i could give you a list of 50 100 people that i'm like oh my god i love all these people because they're great people and the one thing about our shows is that you know what if you're an asshole i'll bring you in once or twice or i'll bring you in when i need you but i don't go out of my way right but you'll notice you know monica real keeps popping up at shows you know i try to get oppie you know when i can i, I love oppie right like there's there's people who repeat a lot or pop up at you know different cities Absolutely. because they're 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 on a list. Right. And you know what that's the thing is like so a lot of my clients if you know depending on whatever the deal is I say hey go have a good time enjoy yourself and if they like you they'll bring you back. That's the really the Keone's, key of it. Keone's. I love Keone. Keone Young. Yeah. Keone's you know. the best. Keone's so awesome and like just the fact that like I know Keone Young, you know, you know Wu from Deadwood you like, Whoa. that was like I, I, one of my favorite shows, one of my favorite characters, like, Ke and, and Keone's a really cool dude. Yeah, you, he's you just to down to earth. Mike, every time we either Nuri or I talk to Keone on the phone, there is every single conversation he asks about you. Every single one. Yep. He's, hey, 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 Chris, how's Mike doing? And we're like, oh, Mike's doing great. Tell him I said hi, okay? No, or, 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 or about it earlier. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I told you I want him on the show on, on our show next week. Oh, that's good. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. We have, Did he we tell have... you I scared him? Oh no, he didn't. Tell uh -huh. us. I, I I told him about all the ghosts in the rat skeller in the basement of the seal box. Oh, we got to talk about this. My, Mike. The seal box. Oh my god. Mike Sandy, do you know that we had a ghost story at the seal box? You do? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I we, did. yeah. We, we have photos of. What? Yeah. Of, we have yeah. yeah. So can, can we tell from the story? This year or the year from, this, from this year. No, from okay. this past year. This year. So yeah. let me tell you a little bit of the story. And I, we were a little bit freaked out the first day of the show because we didn't get any sleep the night before. We had taken, <laughs> we had taken, we had taken a red, red eye. eye. <laughs> we took a red eye flight uh, to the show. And we, so we got in about like four or five in the morning and we immediately yeah. go to check in and, you know, we're exhausted. And it's Margaret Carey and I, and we're, uh, we're, we went, know, to, we went, to, eat. We we went ate, to go we eat, breakfast. we went to go eat and, you know, we're staring at, you know, the, the downstairs that Mexican place next door. No, no, no. It was like five in the morning. So we ate at the hotel restaurant downstairs and okay, we're looking around. Say, parts, not ghosts. Yeah. 
if it was the Mexican place. Was there ghosts in the Mexican food place too? No, I was saying it might have been farts. If it oh, was that's place. funny. That's hilarious. <laughs> but uh, we we go in, we check in, we go upstairs, and I'm you know I'm laying in bed, and you know we turn off the lights, and Chris and I are sharing the room, right? And all of a sudden, separate I'm beds. separate beds, <laughs> and uh, laying laying <laughs> laying there, sitting there, and Chris is dozing off. And all of a sudden, to the right of me, I hear people talking in the corner of the room, uh, having a conversation, a full-on conversation. Wait, wait, hold on. Me. And I said to Chris, I said, Chris, do you hear that? And he, yeah. and he's not responding. So I'm freaking I'm out. Sleeping. I'm freaking <laughs> out because I can hear this full-on conversation. And my anxiety started building up like something, that, like, like that feeling you know have when, right when something's supposed to happen. And literally, my anxiety reached to the top of my head, and all of a sudden, I hear a smash in the room. And I was like, what the hell was that? And I turned on the lights, I freaked out. I'm like, Chris, wake up, Chris. Chris, I don't know what the and hell that up. was. The pen. Yeah, I wake up, I turn over and look at him. Yeah, and I said, Chris, I don't know what the hell that was, but I got to look. And the pen that we had left on the desk was on the floor. It sounded like the pen smacked against the wall as hard as you could throw it and landed on the floor. Yep. That was the first first scenario. Now, Chris, t t tell them what happened the second night. Was that the pen in the shoe? No, the pen. No, yeah, it was the the card in the shoe. So it was yeah. the, the key card. Oh, right? No, no, no. The card, our, key, our key card, his key card ended up in my wallet. And I was on one side of my stuff was on one side of the room. His was on the other. And to get to where each side of the room was, the, the bed and the wall was so close. Like, there's no way we wouldn't know that each other was passing each other. So for one thing of his to be on my side of the room was, like, impossible. impossible. Like, it just wasn't going to happen. And I woke up, and his key card was in my wallet. Like, yeah. not, like, laying on top. I mean, inside How my you wallet. No, it was his. It because was, I had I was, mine in there. I was missing mine. I was missing my. Key, I was missing my key card. I couldn't find it. I was looking for I'm, my key card. I'm very, I'm very particular about my stuff. It's look <laughs> right next to me, right here on my desk. This is exactly how I put my stuff. I got my keys. I got my wallet, and I and then my my phone is here. And I put all three of them. I'm very anal about it. I don't like people touching them. I don't, dude. So for his stuff to be in there. That's impossible. It another just another scenario is that the pen uh, in the middle of the night it would keep keep ending up in my shoe by the time the morning would hit. So three nights in the road, the pen would be in my shoe. Um, <laughs> yeah, the next morning it was the huh? desk pen, hotel desk pen. Just a hotel yeah. issued pen. Hotel issued yeah, pen. It would be in it would be in my shoe in the morning every 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 night. It scared the hell out of me. I was freaked yeah. out by Sunday. And then Chris had an experience where I went to bed early and he heard talking in the room like I had heard and he took photos and he yeah. caught orbs everywhere around us. That's what we got, got those orbs in, in the, the in the basement in the, of the seal box. That's so in 2018 Jose our DJ, a karaoke DJ was he did a video of Monica Real singing karaoke. And he's like, Sandy, you got to see this. you got to see this video. And he's bringing up a video of Monica singing karaoke. I was like, I don't want to watch somebody sing karaoke. He's no, 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 you don't understand. you got to see this. I was like, okay. And so I start watching and I'm like, what? And he goes, just wait for it. And then this orb comes up and then shoots off the screen. And it's on video. Oh, my God. That's and I was crazy. like, I don't get it. There's lights in the room. He goes, "That's a ghost." Yeah, jeez, yeah. that that that's crazy to me. I mean, you know, I I'm glad there, we stayed. Didn't you? Didn't you? Wasn't there that also that night when I took the picture? Didn't you say that you saw like a light above the door? Oh my above god, the bathroom he's door. Right. And then he's I, right. when I took the picture, there was a a random light, like you know when you take a picture with he your phone. He thought it was crazy. The light I was, is, yeah, I was, no, the light was, is all like you know even. There was a light, like a, a streak of light. We were like, watching that went TV. Across exactly where he said it was. We were watching yeah. TV, and I'm on my phone, and I swear, I I tell him, I'm like, Chris, did you see the lightning in our room? <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> crazy stuff. He yeah, goes, I thought no, he was I, nuts. I, I didn't was like, see the lightning dude. in my room. <laughs> and so when he took the photo later, in the photo is that yeah. shock of lightning that I told him right where it was. 
it really yeah. crazy, really crazy. Did you know uh, that, that F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote part of The Great Gatsby? He in that did, hotel? right. Yeah. yeah. And that Al Capone yeah. used to play poker there? Yep, we went did, in the room. Yeah. We went in the room. Yeah, we, was, we took the tour. Did they show you the yeah, dumb waiter? The uh, yeah. They did. They showed us the dumb waiter. But there's actually parts of the catacombs of that hotel that are closed off. I mean, yeah. you know, there's only stories that they have there that people were killed in the catacombs. So, I mean, there's a oh, lot of God. stuff. So, But you want to know how I felt better after this trip? And this is going to be the worst transition in the history of the world. But I felt better because I read Love Prince. Now, Sandy, oh. you're, a, you're, you're, an, you're, an, you're an author. A lot of people don't know this. Can you tell them where to find your book? Uh, tell us a little bit about it. I think it, you know, people need to read your book because I'm all about the Mr. Rogers feel in my life. And that for me, when I read that book, it, it is the current Mr. Rogers feel for me. Oh, thanks. That's a Aww. huge compliment. Um, you can buy the book on Amazon Kindle or on our store on galaxycon.com slash store. Um, physical from us, um, digital from Amazon. Um, I wrote it because I, you know, I, I felt, Aww. oh, is that Mr. Rogers? <laughs> that's awesome. Like, that's not love. <laughs> Mr. Rogers with Daniel. Yeah. I, I wanted my nephew to know that you could create love on your own and you didn't have to wait to get it from other people. And that, and I didn't Aww. want him to feel without love ever in his life. And sometimes so if cool. we have the mind, if we have the mindset that we get love from others, then that there's never enough of that to make us feel good about ourselves. The only way we can really feel good about ourselves is if we know how to create love on our own and uh, fill ourselves up and share it with others. And so when I told him that, um, I said, did you know that you can ask your heart for love anytime you want and it'll just give it to you? And Aww. he said, oh yeah, I know. When I ask my heart for love, it gives me so much love. It comes out of the top of my head and my feet. And when I walk, I leave a prince. And um, I just thought that that was the most amazing thing a five-year-old could say. And uh, he just warmed my heart. And so I, I had that rattling in my head for a long time. And I couldn't figure out how to get it out, how to share the story. And I, in no way, felt like a children's book author. Didn't know how to do it at all. And I thought, you know what, that's the one format that really works for this story because I want this message for people who feel like they could use a little more. And I think that I wrote the book for new moms of little ones who can't read yet. And so I feel like that's a category of people, you know, new moms definitely feel depleted and also feel in love. And so reminding them that when they do feel depleted, they can fill themselves back up was just a really important thing for me. And then having the kids hear it from such an age that they would grow up just being like, yeah, of course, of course they make love on my own. Who doesn't know that? You know, I think it's amazing that your, your nephew had the you know mindset to be able to say that. And it's, it's such yeah. a powerful yeah. thing. And I think we lose it as we grow up. So yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that he never loses it. Um, and I think Chris and I are constantly working to make sure that we maintain whatever little we have left. So I think that's, <laughs> uh, that's a I think it's a beautiful thing. And I just wanted to promote it because it does. I love that book. I do think it like, and when I say Mr. Rogers feel to it, I, I really do mean that. So um, Mike, Sandy, do you have anything that you want to promote before we, you know, sort of wrap this up? No, I mean, we've been showcasing <laughs> everything. <laughs> where, where can we find you? Give us the websites, the social media. You know, at, I think GalaxyCon, Galaxy right? GalaxyCon.com. At GalaxyCon.com. Uh, I'm trying everything. to think. Everything. Okay. Chris, do you, do you want to wrap it up? Sure. Uh, before we take off, we want to tell you a few things. Our next show will return uh, next Sunday. 5 p.m. Pacific, and we want to announce our special guest for next week's program is going to be Mr. Bradley Pierce of Jumanji and Chip from Beauty and the Beast. Yay! Yay. Chip. Uh, <laughs> I love Beauty and the Beast. I, I know. I, uh, I love Beauty so and the Beast, too. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that he's going to be uh, providing some insight on some Jumanji stuff, which I think is going to be really cool because the second movie just came out last year, so that's going to be fun. So Yeah. 
for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, once again, this has been uh, – Chris, did you end it off? Hey, here before we go. Huh? Gilbert Boy, Gilbert Boy has just chimed in. Nice of you to join us, Gilbert. Hey, Tom. Gil. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's know. funny. We're I, like it, ending the show. And he Gilbert's a the- very important <laughs> agent, so he's been very busy all night, you know, wheeling yeah. and dealing and making deals. So, you know, it, it, it's <laughs> nice that, you know, he's able to jump in. Um, what are you going to say, Neary? Oh, no, I was just going to say that I told him uh, a couple weeks ago, I'm like, I'm going to have Mike and Sandy on. He goes, oh, cool. Okay. Uh, nothing. Absolutely <laughs> nothing. Thanks. Thanks, Gil. So supportive. I, I don't know if you saw Ian said hello a little while ago. He's Oh, watching. I didn't. He is watching too. Oh, uh, is Ian on too? I lo- yeah, I love these guys. Uh, yeah. And then I, I'm going to post it up there so we see it. Crystal, GalaxyCon.com. Right, and, and I'm going to answer this question from Saki the Sock Puppet because Saki has asked this question <laughs> about 10 times during the stream and we haven't had a chance to um, The we- Chicago show? Yeah, we're not going to do a Chicago show. I'm very sorry, but if you want to see a Galaxy Con, it won't be in Chicago. We have we have a rule. Ah, uh, our rule. I will. We we don't put on shows where there are other large scale pre existing shows that fill the need for a show. So Chicago has C two E two, and it has you know it has C two E two. It has C two E two. Um, used to have yep. another show too, but. And it's not uh, what it used to be. no, but see, we got Bridge Wizard World, right? So, well, yeah, then, so <laughs> when we pick a market, we're looking for markets where there's a real genuine need for our shows, and there's still right. enough markets like that out there that you know we can't we would just continue to expand for years and years and years before we'd ever get to one of these major markets. And, and it's right. difficult to keep adding shows, I mean, it's it's, a lot, it's a lot of work, and we put a lot of work into each show, more so than most people put into a single show. And so the strain on the on the team to, to add, I'd rather, we'd rather have quality shows than quantity of mediocre shows. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad good. you guys have them. And then there's Sandy's Ian. I'm, I'm putting Ian. Ian. <laughs> yeah, Ian. My mother. With her picture, her my mother bring up my mom again. Is oh, that's Sandy's mom? No, I know. I'm pulling him up. Oh, bring right. that, bring that back up. Hang on, wait, wait, stay here. So this is a picture from a show with Shatner. That's the family photo. Yeah. With Ian, Sandy, me, and my mom, and 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 Bill, and uh, oh, cool. and go back to Mary Martin. Uh, there you go. Look at that, John, John Travolta. Travolta. <laughs> See, I thought it was really cool. You guys got to, you guys got to meet John Travolta and Olivia Newton-John in costume, right? Yeah, yeah. That's we weren't expecting the costumes. We were thrilled. thrilled. That was when was this? They they went to Florida and did it somewhere. I think it's amazing. In Florida, what? the street from us, they did a Grease sing along, and they did oh like my a green night thing. Where it was like they were in for what are they? They were in West Palm. They were in Tampa, Tampa and Jacksonville. Jacksonville. And it was wow. it was a grease sing along. It was magical. It was in a that is so cool. theater. It was amazing outside, and wow. they showed the movie. Everybody sang along with it, and then you know Travolta, Olivia Newton-John, and three of the the T Birds. The um the, uh. the meet and greet tickets were outrageous, but they were less than it would cost to fly any one of them in. So, right, <laughs> still a once like, in a lifetime yeah, thing. Well. Did they get to? Did they sing any of the classics? The great, so they, I assume, sang you know summer sang, nights and stuff like that. They sang afterwards she sang in the Q and A. Yeah, bit, yeah. They both sang. Yeah. And and they dressed up for it. They did the whole thing. He he had on the. You could see he's got the hair on. <laughs> and he was. I mean, he was so nice. He was just ridiculously, yeah. really nice. He just was great. Like, yeah, he's a cool he, dude. He's a movie star. Yeah. <laughs> Philip Glasser actually knows him pretty well. So, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe one day that would be fucking phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. So, Chris, end us off, please. All right. We're, all right. Here we go. Uh, once again, I'm Chris Arsaga. You can follow me at The Real Arsaga on Instagram. And the words of our favorite luck dragon, never give up and good luck will find you. And this has been Nary Lemus. You can follow me at the real Nary Lemus on Instagram. Just leaving you with a small reminder always keep your feet on the ground, reach to the stars, and never forget to stay inspired. Night, everybody.
Good night, everyone. Good night.